observe a certain kind of fact, then one uh, is supposed to say, I believe that P, if one is asked, do you believe that P? If one tastes something and someone asks me, do you taste this property, then I say, I taste this property. That's how they learn by an ascent routine to use that kind of terms. But that's not enough to make corrective vowels, as I said before. Uh, what is missing that children only later on then have to learn the correctness conditions that they have to observe. Uh, so they have to learn that an expression of the form I am in this mental state is supposed to be caused by this mental state, it is supposed to express one's belief, and it is, uh, these are statements that can be doubted under certain conditions when certain defeat is obtained. And that's the uh, empirical question when these conditions obtain and one when not. So children have to learn about these correctness conditions. Well, that's something in addition to just uh, following a certain ascent routine. And that means that these children uh, require a full linguistic competence in order to make vowels that express self, immediate self-knowledge. So a subject has immediate self-knowledge only if she has acquired full linguistic competence that includes both what I'm called following Gordon ascent routines for making claims of the form I am in this state of knowledge and also knowledge about the correctness conditions of such assertions. And for that reason, and that's then uh, the conclusion I was announcing at the beginning, immediate self-knowledge is the product of a capacity that is linguistically inquire, acquired and that concerns the linguistic practice of expressing one's own mental states. So here's the quick summary of the talk. I started by saying that uh, we ascribe immediate self-knowledge to subjects that make sincere vowels. That was the, the, the experience of having that knowledge. Uh, I rejected introspectionist explanations of this knowledge as unsatisfactory. I rejected skeptical and rationalist alternatives because they lead into a standoff. I said that expressivism says that corrective vowels express immediate self-knowledge, but eventually we have to see that making correct vowels requires learning the correctness conditions for making those vowels, the kind of conditions that I ex explicated here, and for that reason immediate self-knowledge is a form of a linguistic knowledge. Thank you.
whatever works for reliability theories and the great scale Goldman and all, all of this, you try to apply it to the self uh, knowledge. Of course, there is a tricky thing here about the self because you are outside, uh, you are not relying on what the self uh, is saying, uh, but you are relying on reliable, causal, nomological, whatever version you take from the being in the mental state to the thought, the thought about, assuming that you have experimental ways of checking the thought about as well. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you're pointing out uh, uh, a very important point in this discussion that I skipped over very quickly. So, uh, in, the, in a sense model, uh, you have this condition that uh, the forming the subject beliefs has to, has to be uh, normally such that it leads to justified or uh, beliefs or beliefs that uh, uh, qualify as knowledge. And then you have two very different groups. So the one group uh, would be, for instance, people like Brentano uh, would uh, have a, a, a type of in the sense model where they say we have a kind of self-evidence that gives us uh, internal reasons, so that would be a kind of internalist justification of the model. And then you have externalists like uh, Armstrong or Gretzky, who might say uh, there are these monitoring processes and they have a certain reliability, uh, and we do not have to have subjective, uh, accessible information about the reliability. It's sufficient if they are a reliable process, then they satisfy these conditions for it. So we don't need this kind of self-evidence that uh, the phenomenologists are talking about. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to point out here is that, uh, but perhaps I should have made that uh, more explicit, that this is a problem for both of them. This is not only a problem for the, for the internalists, uh, of the or subjectivists about uh, uh, self-evidence, but it's also a problem for the reliabilities. Uh, the reliab also the reliabilities has to, to give me some reason why he thinks that these processes are reliable. Uh, uh, well, very simple, he can tell me, uh, well, I have made uh, uh, sufficient tests, I've, I've put it to sufficient tests. Uh, so how does he test that his monitoring uh, module is reliable? Uh, well, he took a, uh, uh, a number of uh, people, uh, stimulated to have them certain experiences, and what then? He asks them, what kind of experience do you have now? So he shows them this thing and that thing, and then I'm asking you, how does this look to you? And how does that look to you? Uh, without asking the pa patient, you don't get the data about, about the reliability. But once you ask uh, the people, what they give you ba back are avowals. So you have, even in checking your reliability, uh, trust the avowals, that, the sincere avowals that these people make. Uh, and then we are back to the first pretty question. Why do I trust you if you say, that looks right to me now, uh, where does this uh, What's the reason for trusting me to you? And if you are an introspectionist, well, then you would say, oh, well, because I have an, an inner monitor that can monitor the kind of experience that that thing produces in myself, but that's circular. And so I claim that that circularity problem is not just a problem for the internalist, but for the externalist too. Perhaps I didn't put it, you are right in, in taking the Locke and Armstrong, but I was, I was making a, a move that probably you will resist, I said I would say go entirely external this and don't and don't rely on vowels. I mean you establish like a scientist that there is self-knowledge if and only if there is a certain mental state that is neuropsychologically identified and verified and at one end of the causal chain and at the other end of the causal chain there is a 
it's not discussed how you establish, but you establish in the same neuropsychological way. There is a thought evolved, thought on, that is, you know that the behavior only or by other interactions, but there is a thought evolved, and you know that the arrow between them, the causal, is maximally reliable, and, and so, so you don't rely, uh, uh, even if there is a monitoring system involved in this circuit, you don't ask the subjects what they believe or whatever. You just say there is self-knowledge. Inside that head, there is this circuitry that leads from one to the other. Okay. Yeah. I didn't rule out that possibility. So I need an extra argument for that. But if you bring in the, the thought of ours already at that point, that may, may give you a way of still holding on to the in a sense more that is at this point I, I admit that. Yeah. I need an extra argument for that. Uh, let's assume that you have a jungle boy who was he grew up in jungle and he didn't have any kind of exposure to uh, human society, so he didn't learn any natural language. Okay. And he's hungry. And to my opinion, it's a little bit odd to say that he doesn't have any kind of immediate self-awareness of the fact that he's hungry. And I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to this immediate in the sense of, uh, for instance, the Brazilian acquaintance, because immediate means exactly to have a direct contact with your mental state. Mm -hmm. So wh what do you think? It's he really different from us? I mean, if you are going to scan his brain and ask uh, in be something substantial different from this, uh, well, not maybe not a boy. It's an adult who grew up there because he passed up over the, the, the limit of seven years old. Right? Um, I think that actually that your question uh, is, 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 con uh, is connected to this one. So my response so far would be um, that uh, if there such a uh, case is possible at all, uh, we could grant this person that he has thought about or higher order beliefs that are true. So whenever he feels hungry, he has this mm -hmm. self-scanning device uh, that generates both a higher order belief, second, second order belief, and this process may, if it's reliable, uh, generate a true belief. Uh, does that already uh, suffice to say that this person possesses knowledge? Uh, it seems that we have uh, a belief I uh, granted that the belief may be true, so that the belief is there uh, whenever the, the, the experience of being hungry is there. So we also have a certain reliability there, uh, but I still uh, uh, think that we should, it would be kind of uh, making the concept of knowledge a very cheap one to apply it in such a case. Why do we believe that? Uh, that something, some uh, additional condition constraint on, on knowledge isn't satisfied here. Uh, and perhaps what I'm having here in my mind is a kind of uh, uh, Wittgensteinian intuition, that uh, as you describe this case, I would have, my, my question would be, uh, how could this system or this jungle boy uh, find out that uh, he might be mistaken? Uh, so you, you, you see, I all had, also had an argument against this rationalistic conception that thinks that conceptually, uh, there's a link between making a, a sincere vowel and having knowledge. 
So I have an argument that uh, our evolution can, under certain circumstances, mm -hmm. circumstances be uh, defective. So at that point, I would have to have to make the parallel claim about the thought evolves. Also, the thought evolves can be under certain con conditions uh, correct, or true, but under other conditions, they can be uh, uh, misleading or false. Uh, and that very well goes together with the, with the idea of reliability, because reliability you always have, uh, whenever you have reliability, you have conditions where the system can break down and get unreliable. So reliability is, not, uh, is never perfect. So we have uh, those thought about also second order beliefs. We have uh, a certain kind of reliability, but we also know that under certain circumstances, this reliability uh, will break down or will produce false belief. Now, is this jungle person uh, able uh, to produce for herself uh, some kind of criterion or for some kind of uh, 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 control? self-controlled mechanism to find out when she is correct in thinking that she is now feeling this and not feeling that. And my doubt would be that uh, this kind of self-control cannot be, uh, uh, this condition of self-control isn't met in this condition. So that, that you need a second person or integration in the linguistic com community uh, uh, to make that kind of distinction between cases where you can trust your only vowels and not trust your only vowels. So the case where you mistakenly believe that you are tasting something sweet because somebody has given you a, a fake sugar, uh, the important lesson of this is that you need somebody else who gives you this extra uh, piece of information. Look, I gave you not a real piece of sugar, but I gave you a, a, a fake sugar. And in this way, I produced uh, uh, this misleading impression that you are tasting something sweet. Without getting this extra information from a second person from outside, you would never be in a, in a position to distinguish real the taste, the, uh, the difference between uh, the real condition and the fake condition. You would always assume that, given that you have the same kind of experience, uh, what you taste is real sugar. So that would be the kind of uh, uh, way how I would try to rule, rule out this general case. Uh, the problem is detecting the possible mistakes and making your own thought about it. But it's a good question, thank you. Again, now from a Lockean mm -hmm. perspective, there is a way of reading Locke saying that the subject is constructed through a series of empirical events to which you may or may not add linguistic content. Let's say we do add linguistic content. And therefore, the child is learning to say, I'm hungry. What is the child learning there is to connect not only the eye and the hand to learn that there is some sort of, sort of, sort of subject there, but these various experiences uh, are similar experiences. And the statement yesterday and the statement today and so on are somehow the same kind of statement that leads into the same kind of thing. And, and that's what, what the law produces knowledge, both knowledge of the eye, uh, otherwise the jungle boy wouldn't be able to say I. Oh, I mean, he would be able to identify himself as a, as a subject, but also in terms of continuity, that there is no way of saying that some sort of thought awareness that led me to chase a goat yesterday is the same kind of thing that will let me stay to pick an animal. Uh, you always have the problem that you don't know uh, are the ideas 
when he speaks of ideas, are these just mental things, or are these ideas uh, also linguistic expressions? Uh, sometimes he obviously means both, uh, and sometimes he more or less seems to mean by idea just uh, concepts uh, that might also or, uh, a preconceptual mental content that is not language dependent. So, in, in the historical block, I think we have the difficulty that. Uh, this notion of idea is just shifting back and forth between things that are language involving and things that are not language involving. But what you are uh, raising is this issue of, uh, uh, of memory that, uh, or episodic memory, uh, as it's now called, uh, that constitutes our personal identity, according to the Hawkean theory of personal identity. So that uh, uh, but I, I still have to think where exactly this comes in because uh, all these avowals are about current mental states. So if I'm saying I'm hungry now, or I'm believing now that I'm in Bucharest, how far do I, how does uh, uh, tempor the temporal extension of myself come into, into the, into, uh, come to play a role here at all? Uh, in a linguistic account, if I know that I'm going this kind of proposition, yeah. uh, that I learn corresponds to this kind of state. Yeah. But uh, in the case in which you don't have language, yeah. then... So I think it's the second step. And here I think you are right. I might point out something important. Uh, where was this? The two stages, yeah. So. Children may learn these ascent routines, uh, and that's maybe something very much focused on the present moment. So if I'm now observing that something is the case, I'm now allowed to say, uh, this is, I believe this is a watch. Uh, but what about the second step? When they learn those correctness conditions, that when they learn that when they say, I am now tasting something sweet or feeling hungry, that, they, that, that this is supposed to be a state that is caused by the state. Uh, I think when we try to spell out what, what it means to understand that correctness condition, you have to go beyond the present moment. Uh, it's supposed to be caused uh, means that uh, if a person previously said, I am in M, and we later find out that it wasn't in M, uh, that shows that his avowal wasn't correct. So we have to assume that a certain kind of the same person that formerly made this avowal is now, has now, uh, has now to admit uh, or take back this and said, uh, no, my, my, my avowal wasn't correct because it turned out I wasn't in this mental state. So, for instance, the therapist told me that I wasn't in this mental state, so I, I shouldn't have about uh, that I'm in this mental state. Uh, uh, and probably also about the other conditions. So, if there comes in uh, 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 important that persons must have some concept of self identity over time. Uh, and now your question was. Uh, That question was. <laughs> <laughs> I think <laughs> the question was that um, I, I see so two kinds of problems connected with the counterexample that my colleague was yeah. offering, and I was wondering whether my impression was that you have replied by saying uh, that this linguistic component is solving the problem of uh, preserving the connection between some sort of. Yeah thought awareness and, and the same kind of thought awareness and action in the next moment of someone's life. Yeah. That I see how you preserve this if you have language and if uh, self-knowledge is language dependent, it's all right. Uh, we can even say, well, this is how we learn who we are. This is how we learn how to express ourselves when we were children. It doesn't, it's not necessarily a correspondence relationship. It's a, an evolutionary but if you don't have this uh, language, then you are back to the problem. Yeah. 
So if we can have a DRF present or an identity that just relies on, on this Lockean idea of memory that uh, uh, you constitute your, yourself over time by having a memory of what uh, uh, your experience were previously uh, and then uh, at this previous moment you also had experience about the previous and, uh, uh, and by adding up this gives you a kind of you know, con con uh, continuity. You could do that without talking to other people, without linguistic con communication and then perhaps a thing like self-correction you could also do just by yourself as, uh, as the lonely jungle person that you now find out that how you thought about your experience yesterday was a mistake. Then you wouldn't need language, so that would strengthen the argument. I can see that. Uh, but here's a, uh, a, a challenge for, the, for this Lockean theory of personal identity. What about those quasi memories? So quasi memories are where you now have uh, uh, the perfect expression that yesterday when you uh, uh, tasted the soup that you have been cooking, it tasted like a coconut, uh, and it is not a real memory. Uh, you mixed up what went on yesterday with what went on in your dreams, uh, and for that kind of confusion, you now uh, mistakenly believe that you uh, tasted the coconut soup yesterday. Uh, it's not a memory, it's a quite crazy memory. So that would then again be the point where I said you need the second person. Uh, uh, you need the second person to correct you and say, look, uh, we had this soup yesterday together and it wasn't a coconut soup. It wasn't a coconut soup, it was a very simple uh, beef soup. Uh, and I don't know where you have the idea of coconut taste. Uh, it must come from your dreams of from, from somewhere else. So you make a mistake about your previous experiences and again you're in a, in a, not in a position uh, to correct yourself without the help of, of the others. So the same kind of response. example who, uh, which in fact may endorse your play. Uh, this time let's uh, uh, discuss about an urban boy or an urban girl. Okay? So don't discriminate. And uh, let's call it uh, Miruna. And Miruna has at least three stages. She has, a, she is uh, six months old. She is somewhere between two and three and she's over five and she's hungry in all these uh, ages so she has this sensation of being hungry when she's very young uh, she doesn't speak any language she's in the process of acquisition of uh, natural language um, she will manifest uh, herself uh, I don't know, by crying, expressing this hunger by crying, right? Now, when she's uh, somewhere between two and three years old, uh, and that, I think that's the most interesting thing, um, most probably she will say, Miruna is hungry. She's referring to herself using this third uh, person approach. And after that will come the acquisition of uh, using uh, ident uh, identical, uh, indexical, and she will say, I'm hungry, mm -hmm. right? So, somehow, it seems from this empirical evidence that we first need to acquire a natural language and afterwards we'll have uh, this ability to use I regarding to ourselves. The problem in my case, so it would be okay if you are using only um, natural lang language as a condition to um, uh, inner knowledge. But you have that immediate. And again, I, I have a problem with that immediate. Immediate means unmediated. And in fact, the mediation is between me and me. 
right? So this is why I, I really uh, can see how language plays here a constitutive role. But otherwise, with self-knowledge, I tend to agree that you are right. But the problem is it is a need. Yeah. Uh, so there's no, no need to define myself here, just to, to add to, to your remarks that in using the indexical I, I think we can distinguish between a non-emphatic and an emphatic use. Mm -hmm. So what we observe in these very young children between two and three years is that they move back and forth. They sometimes say, uh, Miranda is hungry, and then they say, I am hungry, and then they say, Miranda. So they, they use the index I uh, uh, in the same way in which they learn to use their own name by imitating the other people. So it's a, a sort of imitation. So they, other people call them the Mar Miranda, so they call themselves Miranda, and uh, they, uh, I, I would say that's the kind of non emphatic sense where the index is just used. Uh, uh, by applying some routine, some test routine. Now, what's, what happens in the emphatic case? Uh, the emphatic case, the typical way when you, uh, uh, where you emphatically use the first person pronoun is when you're challenged. Uh, when you say, I'm hungry, and I say, I don't believe that because I just saw you eating this pile of food, it's impossible that you're hungry now. Then you say emphatically, but I am hungry. Uh, and there you make this insistence uh, that uh, you are in a position uh, to sincerely avow this. Uh, and you insist also that you can do that, that you satisfy the spontaneity condition. Uh, because once you start reflecting on this, when you say, okay, you're right, I just eat that kind of soap. Why do I think I'm hungry now? You're right, there's some, uh, something uh, unexplainable going on. Then you're in a position of this person who claims to love his wife when his friends point out that he is uh, not treating his wife correctly. Uh, then you start to reflect on your states, and what happens then, that then uh, you lower your emphasis, or your emphasis will go away. You're not ready anymore to say, but I love my wife, or I love my wife, or I know I love my wife. Uh, then you just say in the, in the way in which the child, uh, uh, child says, well, I think I love my wife. Uh, and you might even then switch to using your proper name and say, I believe me, John, loves his wife. And that's what John does. John is a loving person, and I'm married with my wife, so I love her. So you retreat from this first-person perspective with the emphasis. Uh, once you put in the emphasis, that's when you believe that you satisfy all your correctness condition. That's what the emphasis gives you. There was a question over there. Yes. Ah, Mario. Hi. Hi. Um, so there are some philosophers who say that there is a phenomenology of thought, or there are various phenomenologies of phenomenology, so that these play a role in uh, self-knowledge. So we know that we are in a certain mental state, we know that, that we have a certain thought due to the phenomenology of that mental state or of that thought. Would you categorize this position that phenomenal character as an epistemological role as being part of the introspectionist model, the inner sense of the acquaintance theory, or is it something different? And if so, uh, if it is part of the introspectionist model, do you think that it has the same problems as the other two uh, theories of the introspection example? I would distinguish this uh, 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 as sharply as possible, and I would do it not with, for the same reason, but in the same way as uh, our common hero, uh, uh, Reintano, did when he distinguished it between uh, inner perception and introspection. In German, uh, innere Wahrnehmung und Introspektion. So, uh, uh, Brentano might be a, uh, or the view that you sketch might be a form of acquaintance where you say uh, if there is a certain experience, I am aware of this experience in terms of the phenomenon, if, 
or if, if, if there is a thought, uh, if there is a thought, then the subject is aware of this thought because of a certain phenomeno phenomenology of this thought. But Brandano would say because he has an uh, inner perception of this thought. Uh, and I would then uh, deny the second step and say, but that doesn't mean that he uh, is in the special relation that warrants to ascribe knowledge of that uh, thought. So you can have the phenomenology of thought while you're thinking, but that doesn't mean that you already have knowledge of this thought. Uh, yeah, so that's the that's how I would put it. And now comes the uh, comes the task to argue for that. Uh, but that's where I uh, would break up the acquaintance more and say we can have the awareness that doesn't count phenomenology in that awareness that doesn't count as knowledge. Yeah, so those are my, my uh, some of my doubts as well about acquaintance because you can have so you are emphasizing here an epistemology from the word acquaintance. Yeah. So for uh, acquaintance having certain epistemic capacities, but you can also have non epistemic capacities. Yeah. And why this phenomenology considered this as a kind of non epistemic approaches. Do you know people who call that non epistemic acquaintance? No, not, not actually. Um, but there are philosophers who say that uh, an analogy plays an epistemological role. So, like David Pitt in his article um, about the analogy of thought, he, uh, he goes on this model of acquaintance and he considers that it's the phenomenology of the thought that allows us immediate self knowledge of the thought. Yeah, but that would be the classic very much the classical model. Yeah, the classical model. Yeah. But it's interesting that we could also have a position that agrees that we have the phenomenology of thought that does not give us this immediate set of knowledge. That would be kind of kind of non non epistemic acquaintance. Why wouldn't you set a pattern to that? So I think I have exhausted your patience. <laughs> Thank you for staying so long here. Uh, uh, be nice to see you again tomorrow.